Hello, how are you guys doing? Welcome to First Love Calvary Chapel's Good Friday service. And why is it a Good Friday? Because it's a Good Friday for those that believe. It's the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross for us so that way we could be forgiven, so we could be born from above, and so we could have eternal life. And so you know what? We need everything that the Lord has to give us. In this message today, we're gonna listen to it and then we're gonna take communion together afterwards. And so I would encourage you to um, have the communion ready with your family, um, some grape juice. And I know there were people in the church that were gonna be passing that out to households and we bought them in prepackaged um, grape juices and prepackaged crackers. Um, and so they will not be hand touched and so just real, real clean. And so we need what God has to give. We need the bread of life. We need the bread from heaven. We need that drink which God has to give us. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's it. He gave her son on that cross that whosoever, and that whosoever is you and that whosoever is me, would believe in him, we shall not perish. We shall not be separated from God for all eternity, but we shall have eternal life in the presence of the Lord. That's what God has for us. And God demonstrated his love in the act of love on that cross. God demonstrated his love, he so loved, and this is love that a man would lay down his life for his friends and that Jesus would call us his friends. Now this is part two, by the way, of the message that started out on Wednesday. So if you wanna catch part one, you'll go ahead and tune it in from Wednesday on ccwhittier.org. But I will tell you that the message is called The Cross of Christ Yesterday, Today, and Forever. Because this is an all-time message. This is definitely the greatest action of love, the greatest story of mankind that anyone could ever hear or that I could ever tell you. You know, when we, we talk about love, I remember this one brother that used to go to our church and he had a kidney situation. And he had a friend who hadn't seen his friend in a long time, but still had his friend in his heart and went into surgery and donated a kidney to his friend and gave his friend many more years with that donated kidney. Man, when you give a part of yourself for somebody else, just like a mom would give her whole life for those children, when you give a part of yourself or all of yourself for somebody else, that's when you really love them. And if somebody would have your back so much that they would lay down their life for you, I mean, that is definitely great love. In John chapter 10, and if you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to it. And reminder that at the very end, we're going to take communion together, all right, on this Good Friday. John chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 18. So if you would, it says, No one can take my life from me. These are the words of Jesus. I sacrifice it voluntarily. And I am reading this from the New Living Translation, okay? But I, I love the way it words it. It says, I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and I also have the authority, or I also take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. See, Jesus had the ability to lay it down and to take it up. He could lay down his life voluntarily, willingly for you and I. What would lead a person to do that for another person? And not just another person, but for sinners. And that definitely was that he was a friend of sinners. He definitely came to save sinners. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, Just think how much more surely the blood of Christ will transform our lives and our hearts. His sacrifice frees us from the worry of having to obey the old rules, that's the law, okay, the old rules, and make us want to serve the living God. It says, for by the help of the eternal Holy Spirit, Christ willingly gave himself to God to die for our sins, he being perfect without a single sin or fault. And by the way, that was not just the New Living, but that was the Living Bible paraphrase. And I wanted to read it to you because I'm trying to bring out a point that it was a sacrifice. The point that it was willing, willingly, it was voluntarily, and it was to do that for us. In, in the book of Psalms, chapter 22, Jesus, not, well, Jesus through his word, but, but King David had predicted that 
the Savior would die on a cross in chapter 22, verse 16 of the book of Psalms. It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Now, crucifixion had been used by other countries as a, as a form of, um, you know, torture, but it hadn't been perfected as capital punishment until the Romans took it over. And so, yet David, who lived long before Jesus did, predicted that this would be the way that the Savior would die. They pierced my hands and my feet. And, and of course, when Jesus rose from the dead, he was willing to let Thomas see, you know, put your hand in my side. Look at, look at my hands. Put your, your hand in here. Feel this, you know, realize that the resurrected Christ still has the scars. And so when we are in heaven with Jesus, we're going to get to see those scars. We're going to know, man, this is where he was crucified. So that's where the story goes well into eternity as far as even seeing where they crucified our Lord. You know, in the Jewish faith, there have been many rabbis that Jews, even in our time, thought like, oh, well, maybe this guy is the Messiah. And, and they have. I, I've listened to these things on the news. And, and then, of course, that particular Jewish Messiah ends up dying, just like anybody might die of old age. And, you know, but he really wasn't the the savior of the people. He wasn't their Messiah. And the scriptures in Isaiah 53 mention that he would die for the sins of many. And, and really, nobody would ordinarily just die for the sins of somebody else. You know, I, I know the Apostle Paul, he, in one place in his life, he was basically willing to give up eternity so that way Israel could be saved. And that, that's pretty big. And, and of course, actually dying for the sins of the world is also such a, a great thing. But this particular, um, one particular rabbi was arguing the point that, that no man could really die for the sins of another man in order to disprove Jesus. And because there's scripture in Ezekiel that says that the soul that sins will die, like meaning each person's responsible for their own sin and, and death comes upon man as a result of sin and then you face God. And so how could I die for the sins of somebody else? Because people can't really bear the iniquity of another person. But even though one man can't die for the sins of another, what that particular rabbi was missing and wasn't understanding, that there is God the Father and there is God the Son. And that Jesus was not entirely and wholly human. He was also born of a virgin and straight from the Father. And, and so this Jesus then would be able to be a substitute for the sins of others, like an animal, but better than an animal. You know, as an animal sacrifice was there for a blood covering for sin, for their redemption. And they even to this day celebrate a day of redemption. And for you and I, that redemption, that forgiveness, that purchase of us to God, is, is always available for us in the blood of Jesus Christ. So one man could die for another man if they happen to be Jesus, who was also God. And, and so Jesus, I'm so happy, is that substitute because Adam, who sinned, and the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. That was a very dark day. If we want to talk about Good Friday being a dark day, that was a dark day when the, the sin came into mankind and was passed on to the rest of the human race. And, and no person would be sufficient to remove their own sin. So he tries covering it. And then God puts a covering on him. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, talking about the substitutionary work of Christ, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just, and Jesus being the, the one that was just, the innocent one, it says, For the unjust, you and I who are not innocent. It says that he might bring us to God. So Jesus was that go-between between the Father and mankind and the way that that gulf could be bridged and that gap could and that separation, because your sins have separated you from God, that separation could be dealt with. So it says that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, of course, as Jesus rose from the dead. You know, People usually, even if they had that opportunity, would not die 
for the sins of somebody else. There's a scripture, and I want you to look in your Bible if you can. It's in Romans chapter 5, and it's verses 6 to 10. And it talks about how somebody may lay down their life for somebody else, but it would be a rare case. And it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Anybody have any ungodliness in your life before you came to Christ? How about after you came to Christ? Has Christ died for the ungodly before? Has Christ died for the ungodly after? You can say amen. It says, for scarcely, in Romans chapter 5, verse 7, it says, for scarcely, for a righteous man will one die. Like, even though you know this is a great person, but would you really die for that person? Scarcely would somebody die for the righteous person. It says, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it's almost like you're, you're dying for your enemies. You're dying for people that are crucifying you. You're, you're dying for somebody who doesn't love you yet, who hasn't repented yet. And yet you are, are giving that to them as a gift. And then it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we've been declared innocent by the blood of Christ. It says, We shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, can I hear an amen to that? That we are saved from the wrath of God through the death of the Son of God. For if when we were enemies, and which we were enemies, did you ever know that, boys and girls and young people, you were an enemy of God? It says we were enemies, now we're reconciled through death, through the death of His Son, and much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So, because He died for our sins, and because He resurrected and overcame death, so now we are justified and we are, according to this, saved by his life. Thank God for the death and also for the life of Jesus Christ. Now that particular day, there was the yesterday of the cross, and that was 2,000 years ago. But that day of the cross, an exchange for Adam's sin, all being placed upon Jesus Christ, and all the power of darkness that was going on that day, with the Sanhedrin handing Jesus over to Pilate and handing him over to Herod and then back to Pilate again. And all of that, the, the lies and the darkness that surrounded the death of the Son of God. God's response to the dark day of Adam and the dark day of, of Good Friday, his response was the death of his Son to bring eternal life. And if you knew that you could live forever, if you knew that you didn't just cease to exist when you died, if you knew that you would get to have joy forevermore in the presence of God, I'll tell you, that goes from a bad day to a really good day. In Luke chapter 23, verse 44, here's what it says. It says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and then the sun was darkened. So Good Friday in Luke chapter 23 says that it was a dark day. It was a dreary day. The clouds covered the sun and it just became extremely dark so the sun couldn't be seen. It wasn't just a cloudy day. It wasn't just a, um, a, a rainy day or something like that. It was just an unusually spiritually dark day that God supernaturally made it darker than any other day. And so the first day with Adam, that was a dark day. And then this with the, the new Adam, Jesus, coming to bring life, where Adam, the first Adam brought death. Um, this was also a dark day, but it was a dark day to bring light upon the world, which would be three days later for his resurrection day. Now, in the law of the Old Testament, there were certain sins that people would do. And if you remember reading about it, certain sins, you were supposed to even stone people. And you would think about that today and you'd think, oh man, that poor girl or that poor guy or man, you know, the severity of sin among the Jews and what God said. And, and so we're very glad that, you know, the New Testament doesn't teach um, anything about stoning because it was the sins of mankind that deserved death and stoning that were placed upon Christ. So even though man would be a lawbreaker and be stoned back then, Jesus died for all lawbreakers. So it doesn't matter how dark your heart is or how far you've been from God, Jesus Christ died on that cross for you. But it takes something 
to appropriate it or to apply it to your life. And here's what it takes. It takes repentance. If we die without repenting, we die in our sins. But if we die in repenting, what is repenting? Repenting is two things. It's turning and saying, Lord, I turn from the sin and I give my sin to you. And it's believing. And Lord, I believe that you died for this sin. So please forgive me. So it's a turning from self and your sinful nature and all of the skeletons in the closet and all of the darkness and the wickedness. And it's turning to God and saying, Jesus, I need you. Now I would say, you know, as believers, it's a one-time act for salvation, but it's an ongoing act as far as keeping that clear path in our relationship with God, isn't it? As we confess our sins to one another, or we also, you know, confess our unrighteousness to him and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. As um, the decision was going on as far as what the Jews wanted to do about Jesus, the high priest at that time made this statement in John chapter 11, verse 50. It says, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for all of the people. So basically, um, the religious leaders were thinking that Jesus was a troublemaker and uh, maybe he was going to cause them to maybe get in trouble with Rome. And so it's expedient. It's, it's more helpful if, if one man should die for all of the people than everybody else be judged and there be riots and more death. And, and not that the whole nation should perish. It's interesting that we are living in times where people are thinking of a nation perishing. Now, praise God that, um, you know, we've pretty much contained this and that they're going to work overtime to create, um, you know, some sort of um, cures for this particular virus. Um, and I, I will say that um, if we could just stay in our homes, if a few people and everybody would just stay in their homes so that way even just a few people, like say 2 million compared to 300 million. Um, but 2 million dying would be a horrible thing, right? So if we, you know, the, the whole picture, a nation being spared by the act of others, you and I not wanting the disease to go to others. And so, um, and I might not have done the best at telling that little analogy right there, but your wheels are turning and you're, you're thinking of it yourself and you, you, you got the picture of what I'm saying. And this guy was, this priest, was unwittingly prophesying that Jesus would die for the world. Now, for political leaders and all of that, you know, is, is it expedient that one man die so the whole nation won't perish? There's hard decisions that political leaders have to make. Back then, of course, um, their decision was a sinful decision because um, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, the scriptures say. But Jesus was very resolute and very focused in his calling. His mind, his actions, his heart were set upon the salvation of mankind. The scriptures say that his face in the book of Luke chapter 9 verse 51, and I'm cutting in and only reading parts of the verses here, but it is from the New King James Version. It says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That was the plan of Jesus, that everything in mind was that I'm going to Jerusalem. My face is set for the journey to Jerusalem. And you and I have to be steadfast like that. You and I have to set our eyes on Jesus and set our mind that nothing matters more. My family doesn't matter more. My friends don't matter more. Even my survival, it says that his loving kindness is better than life. My survival doesn't even matter more than my mind being set toward, Lord, whatever your will is. I want to do it. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. In Luke chapter 24, verse 5, it says here, and this is the words of Jesus. Um, actually, it's an angel quoting the words of Jesus to um, the ladies that came to the tomb. And the angel says, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words because he did tell them all along what was going to happen that happened. And then in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, when Jesus was talking to these other guys after he rose from the dead, it says, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead 
on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. One man die, not just for one nation, but for all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then John chapter 12, verse 32. It says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And this he said, signifying by what death he would die. And the people answered him, We've heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. Like, they didn't understand that he was supposed to die. Then how the, then can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And so Jesus was speaking these things about himself to the people, and the people were curious and wondering about it, as people today should be wondering about Jesus. The Bible says, in Philippians 2, 7, that he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. He came just like you and I from Mary, from, from a woman, born of a woman. It says, and being found in appearance as a man, in appearance as a man because he was only partially man, right? It says, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And that's the message right there that Jesus willingly laid down and sacrificed his life, that death of the cross. He was willing to look bad between a couple of criminals in order to save the world. And so he brings an invitation to us to today that whosoever will, let him come, let him drink of the water, let him drink of the living water. He's calling people by that message. And as many as would believe in him will be saved. So as it says in Hebrews chapter 3, today, if you believe, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And we've got to hear that voice coming from heaven, which is that, that voice of the Spirit speaking to us to turn our lives over to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, this message of the, of the cross is the power of God. Hey, brothers and sisters, don't we all need some of that power? So let's stick with that message and we'll see that power on a daily basis. Whether it's power to repent or power to be forgiven or power to live for God, all of that power that we need is there. And so we need to identify with that message, not just on the day that you were born from above, but every single day that you could say, Jesus, you are crucified and I am crucified with you. That we personally take in that message like food, like we're gonna take communion together in just a moment. And some of you have received at your doorstep um, through servants in the church, these little cups that are already covered that are and the bread that's already covered and, and we bought it prepackaged in a very safe way and, and that you can even wipe off before you take it. And, um, and then some of you will go to the store and buy that, you know, matzah and that grape juice. Um, those of you that aren't, you know, concerned about going to the store lately. And, and we're going to take that communion together as we identify with Christ. And, and we take him in as our, as our food. As it says in John 6, these are the words of Jesus. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He came down from heaven and he gave his body as life from the world. That's the bread of God. That's what we feast upon. That's what we ingest into our spirits and take into our hearts and our minds that Jesus has got to be in us. And even at the baptism of, of Jesus, it was speaking about our salvation. Because as we also follow in that same righteous pattern, when you go into the water, it shows a death. When you're in the water, it shows a burial. And when you come out of the water, as the Holy Spirit dove came upon him, it shows the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we walk out the cross of Christ in our lives, that we take up his cross through him giving us our own cross. And that's the cross of following him in the way that people might perceive you or misunderstand you or take you or even treat you as being a follower of Jesus Christ. The cross today, brothers and sisters, and before we take communion, for many people, it's just a symbol. It's just a piece of jewelry. It's just a religion. It's just a, a church steeple. And they don't understand it. They don't know the wisdom in this message from heaven. 
to them, it's people that go to a church building and follow something that they know nothing about. Maybe it's the person on the workplace that's been a bad witness for Christ and that's what their picture is as far as religion. It's maybe some judgmental conversation they've had with some believer that, you know, maybe was following the law rather than following Christ. It's somebody that grew up in a so-called Christian household that grew up with a parent that spoke very angrily toward them about the wrath of God and during their wayward years they were so afraid of God that they threw it all away. You know, I can't believe in a God like this. And, and most definitely there's, you know, a God of wrath, but I will tell you that the fear of God also contains the love of God and the salvation of a soul. And so the world around us, in their lack of understanding, quickly turns away from this cross of Christ or the faith that we preach based upon the observations of our day. But if we're following Christ, and especially during this coronavirus era and the time where people are going to be trying to find jobs, you know what? People are going to hunger and thirst for God again. And they're going to hunger and thirst for Him through the light that you bring. But this light goes beyond yesterday when Jesus died on the cross, the past. It goes beyond today where people think of Him in the wrong way. But it goes well into the future where Jesus is remembered for eternity. As it says in Revelation 5, 6, that in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb as though it had been slain. You could see in heaven he was the same Jesus that had been slain on earth. And at one time when Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, he said, Behold my hands and my feet. That's Luke chapter 24, verse 39. And he said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And this message is about the crucifixion of Jesus, a message that is never to be forgotten, a message that is to be acted upon, a message that movies have been made about, even one called The Greatest Story Ever Told. It's always to be preached. It's always to be appreciated. And it's not us selling a story or a bill of goods. It's not peddling the word of truth as if it's some product. But it truly is God's story, God's history for mankind. It's a battle story of God battling the forces of evil to bring the salvation of souls. It's the greatest love story ever told. And it is a true story and all you have to do is believe and it will bring salvation even to your household. In Psalm chapter 89 verse 48, and we are closing now and we're about to take communion together, okay? And it says in Psalm 89 verse 48, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? And the truth is, is that we can't do this for ourselves and we can't do this for another. Only Jesus can do this for us. He says, I have come that you may have life. And that's the life that you and I need. If you believe, brother and sister and son and daughter, older and younger person, you know what? You will have life. And I'm going to close with this verse right here that I want you to think about, okay? It's in 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. And here is what it says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Guess what? God wants you to know that you have eternal life. And God wants you to remember it by participating in communion. If you have a cracker at home, maybe you can only eat the bread part of it, okay? Um, grape juice, to remember the blood part of communion. And as I said, we had many servants from church go out and pass this out to houses. They were calling everybody that was on the list. Today, as you are showing up at 12 o'clock or at 7 o'clock for church on Good Friday, I want you to 
put on there, not just that you were watching, but put a message to Pastor John on there. I like to see that our whole church family came together. I like to see and be encouraged as a pastor that our whole family cares about Good Friday and that everybody wasn't just sitting at home watching some Twilight Zone and, and, and being in some Twilight Zone rather than focusing in on what Good Friday is really all about. So anyway, let's, let's take for a moment this, this communion. I've got this matzah here. And I want to thank Jesus, okay? So, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for taking upon us, I'm sorry, taking upon you our sins, Lord. And, Lord, as a pastor and as a Christian and as just a, a, a guy, Lord, I can think of sins that I've done wrong. Now, Lord, for the boys and the girls that are listening and for the moms and dads and the single people that are listening, Help them to think of their sins right now, Lord God. Because, Lord, they need to ask you to forgive them. And I say right now, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And say that with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Say that one more time. Say, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you that your body was crucified for me. That you experienced death so I could have life. Adam brought death. Jesus brings life. Moses brought the law, but the Son of God brought life. Thank you, Lord, for that life. Partake of the bread that you have before you now. Okay, here we go. The body of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We don't deserve this, Lord. We didn't earn this, Lord. But we are grateful for what you did for us. Thank you, Jesus. And then lastly, the cup. And I, I would pour it out if I showed you my grape juice. I've got about an inch or two of grape juice in there. But this is representing the blood that was poured out for us on that cross. You know, people go to Red Crosses and hospitals to donate blood. This is a good time to donate blood, by the way. People are going to need it. And um, kind of putting yourself aside and giving some blood. But, but Jesus gave his blood so we might have life. So let's thank him for that. Jesus, we thank you for donating your blood, Lord. But not just for the few people that will get it, but for this, the, the, the entire human race. So we thank you for that, Lord. And we partake of this cup in thankfulness. So now also say, say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of all of my sins. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for giving me a good conscience, a new heart, and making me a new person. I want to follow you, Jesus, every day. Help me to come to you. Always, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord for that cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who didn't get the um, bread and the cup delivered to your house, or you didn't go to the store and buy some matzah and some grape juice, if you get a chance or somebody's you know doing a run or something like that, say, hey, pick me up some matzah you know, that people are buying for the Passover and some, and some Welch's grape juice. And... and Replay this. Replay this. Now remember guys, part one is from Wednesday. Same message. Part two, so part one was played on Wednesday at 10.30 and 7 p.m. Today's message, 12 noon and also 7 p.m. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you guys and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you lots of peace. And may you be protected and may you go into this weekend and may you come and invite others and share on your Facebook page or tell others that don't have Facebook to go to ccwhittier.org and to watch there our church service for Easter. And we'll be doing services for Easter will be at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock with worship and also at 5 o'clock, 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock, but it's a longer service at 10 and then 5 on Sunday, Easter Sunday. And I'd like to tell you guys, 
happy Easter. And for you kids, you know, maybe your parents can still, you know, dye some Easter eggs with you and you can still find some, you know, just some little fun um, American traditions um, that don't have much to do with Jesus rising from the dead. But, you know, it's a fun holiday, right? And it's a best time to remember our Savior. So, all right, guys, God bless you guys and um, hope to see you all soon. And, and I know that you miss church, you miss me, I miss you, and our hearts are knit together in love. So, hugs and Christian kisses on the cheek, right? That holy kiss. All right. God bless. Hey guys, welcome to our Facebook Live or Facebook Mirror, whatever you're, however you're watching this. Um, but I'm glad and honored to leave you, lead you guys in a time of worship and prayer. So why don't we bow our heads, close our eyes, whatever we do to pray <laughs> to the Lord. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the breath in our lungs, God, and how you sustain all things. Lord Jesus, we just want to come to you in surrender of who you are and how you have changed our lives, Lord, because you are king. There's no other like you. There's no other God like you, no other love like yours, God. Um, and so I pray for anyone who's watching on the other side of the screen, including myself, God, that we would live under your lordship, that we would learn how to be humbled and submissive to your word because there's no other place that we want to go, no other place we want to be than be in your arms. So God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your grace and allowing me to even say that in this prayer, God. Um, I pray that you protect this time of worship, whether it's from distractions at home or even like the noises that's gonna happen when I'm like worshiping, Lord. Would it just all, like everything, like all our focus would be all on you, God because you are worthy, because you are um, so beautiful and lovely, God. So we just thank you so much um, in this time. Amen.
Christ my Savior, he rescued me. Take this life, deliver a vessel of your give us life for those who believed in your name and your son Jesus we're now awaiting your kingdom to come again you've opened our eyes to know your truth you made us your holy people your own possession to use God and you've even turned us back towards you we because of sin we're just far from you, Lord, but you've made us near again, Lord. Made us near to you, yeah. And Lord, as um, we think about Good Friday and Jesus who came, who was obedient, who was perfect, who was God, and he asked in his last days, God, would you remove this cup from me? Your will be done that takes a lot of trust, God. And so we pray that we would trust you, Lord, and that we wouldn't lean on our own understanding, but know that our life is in your hands. Our life is yours because of Jesus.
you care so much about your sheep. You honor us by putting oil on our heads, Lord, you anoint us, God. with our Father. Thank you for standing in our place, bearing our penalty of sin. Would we live our life with hands wide open to you? Nothing that we hold on to because you are so, so good. 